Alex, you don't choose your subjects lightly. Uh, um, why Russia and why Karakovsky to tell Russia's story of the past? Well, I mean, uh, I, in the wake of uh, the 2016 election, you know, Russia was on everyone's minds, mine too, and I was looking uh, to tell a story about it, and um, uh, and two producers I know, uh, John Batsik and P.J. Van Sandvik, had been chasing the Adakowski story for some time and, and, and suggested it to me, and it seemed like a pretty good idea. You know, I'm, a lot of my films have to do with power and abuses of power, and so it seems like Hodakovsky's story, you know, really would capture the the essence of how power works in Russia. You know, he he starts from nothing. He becomes Russia's really most powerful man, and then has you know only the power to take his own life. Um, and then becomes uh, this figure in exile. I thought, what an interesting way to take a look at, at, at Russia. Uh, just tell us a little bit, just from a practical standpoint, did you approach him, at, was, was John and, and, and PJ already John and PJ had made contact with him and then they introduced me to him. I think <clears throat> the people around him were sort of nudging him to try to tell his story. <clears throat> in many ways, he's kind of reluctant to do that. He's, he thinks very abstractly. He doesn't like to reflect on personal details. It's he's he's not exactly Oprah when you sit down with him in terms of gushing about his you know emotional um, interior life. But um, um, but I think he felt that he wanted to get a message out in terms of what was going on in Russia, and so to that end, you know, he was willing to sit down. But I must say, what was intriguing and interesting about him was that um, unlike some other people in this territory that I've met or talked to or, or thought about making films about um, who demanded a great degree of control, Hodakovsky didn't demand anything. And he said he would answer any question and he was true to his word about that. So that aspect of him I was kind of intrigued by. You know, there, were, there, there was no se series of negotiations over how it would be conducted, what we could or shouldn't talk about. He was up for anything. It was difficult initially to get him to kind of open up, but over time it, it, it worked and it helped that I, I did four days of interviews with him before going to Russia and then four days after. And I had kind of walked where he had walked, and I had even been to his house, which he can't go to anymore, uh, and and that w allowed for um, him to be, uh, I think, a bit more honest, and also for me to probe him a little bit more thoroughly because um, his sort of rosy view of how he is perceived in Russia was something that I could confirm to him was not accurate. I mean, he's largely reviled there. It, it, the difference between uh, you know his perception in 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 Moscow or among young people and then what happens outside of of, of Moscow seems very uh, stark. Stark. Well, I, I, I for me it was a surprise. I mean, I didn't really. It was one of the big surprises for me was, you know, you can find a lot of people. You, you ask people in Moscow, what do you think of Putin? And they say, well, he's, he's fine. And then you, you know, after a, a vodka or a beer or something, it's like, what a bastard, I'm so angry. You know, what a, our country's going down a hole. You go to Neftyugansk or Krasnokomensk, and everybody's like, yeah, Putin, he's our guy. Um, that was fascinating to me. So that this divide between city and country, which is... Mm, <laughs> familiar. Familiar. Um, you know, was uh, was something that uh, that seemed very true there. You know, I should say that it's not like um, I didn't go into this as a Russia expert. I, I didn't know that much about Russia, and and it's one of the reasons I narrated the film the way I did. I mean, it was, in a way, it was kind of like deep dive, but for somebody who was a naive, I was learning as I went. But you know, at least in terms of what I discovered. Um, you know, Putin outside of the big cities is quite popular. But, but as, you, as you were saying when we were talking before coming here, you did have no problem shooting in Russia, right? You moved around easily, there was no interference whatsoever, or? No, and, and I've shot in China before, and with, in China, you know, the, the government often attaches minders to you, and you go into a city and the, you know, <coughs> the authorities, you know, are, are, are very mindful of you. 
we kept a low profile, and by the way, I used a Russian crew, which was hugely helpful. Very small crew, um, but, um, you know, while I'm sure that our phones, you know, I brought a burner phone with me. I'd, I'd, I'd been there and shot for this film zero days. So I knew enough to, you know, first of all, every computer, every phone gets suffused with malware whenever you go to Russia. So we bought a burner phone, burner computers, and I'm sure we were listened to. And, and, and certain high-level interviews that we sought, you know, were granted initially, and then as the date got closer, shut down. But in terms of day-to-day, -day, in terms of operating and going places, no, no interference at all. And, and you know, something like the when we shot in the oil fields and got those drone shots and stuff, we didn't ask permission. Um, we just went there. But it helped that you know we went there at four o'clock in the morning on days when it was twenty degrees below zero. Uh, <laughs> but um, but it wasn't like you know we were tailed. We weren't at all. We stared at Airbnb and nephew Gonsk. So there was a great deal of freedom of movement, and and it hugely helped to have. And, and this is this interesting, you know issue about Russia, that uh, it's not North Korea. You know, I think a, a lot of us think that. It's, in many ways, it's, it, it, it's quite um, open. And, and that is both a, accounts for a, um, the, the blessing and the curse of the place. There's a sort of otherworldly feeling in there. You can, you can not notice the oppression for a long time and then suddenly it snaps and you realize for something very small you're now going to be put in prison or um, something like that. The television has, has a big role in, uh, in, 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 the film, in the film and uh, it seems that it's part of, it's very much instrumental into, into the way Putin keeps power and, and yet it seems like an old medium. I mean we, we are beyond that. It does seem like that but you know there's a um, um, Yokai Benkler in this country uh, did a very interesting study in regard to the 2016 election and noted that, you know, for all the talk about Facebook and Twitter, um, the big impact in terms of changing minds and hardening points of view in the 2016 election turned out to be Breitbart and Fox, uh, old school, uh, not, uh, not internet. So. I think particularly for older Russians, TV is it. And they don't really surf the web. Younger Russians do. And, and that is interesting. Um, <clears throat> the other thing that was interesting to me about TV in Russia was that, um, and it was kind of a cautionary, there are a lot of cautionary tales, I think, for us in this film. But the cautionary tale for me was that moment when Malashenko uh, and, and NT, NTV in, in the midst of the Yeltsin election, fake the the you know Yeltsin at his desk when he's really you know sick as a dog yeah. at his dacha. Um, the person who was really watching that very carefully was Vladimir Putin, and so the liberals did it because they felt that the end justified the means. Well, Putin said, "Well, yes, the end justify the end will justify the means for me too." And he took over television. So, you know, it, it's 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 cautionary, I think, for us when we, you know, some of us see Trump and we think, well, you know, he's he's the problem, and therefore whatever we can do to get him out, without regard to inconvenient facts, it, it's a slippery slope. Uh, Trump is obviously, you know, it, it's not even mentioned in in the film. But as you said before, 2016 is part of the reason why you made this movie, where the U.S. are. Bear, you know, they're not mentioned, and, but how did your thought your evolve through making the film, and how do you see th this parallel story being similar to each other? It, it just seemed ineluctable as we were putting it together. I mean, the, when we were making the film, we really wanted to immerse ourselves in Russia, and we made a conscious decision not to ever mention Trump or to get into the Mueller report, with the exception for the brief mention of Prigozhin. Um, that said, it seemed like there were a lot of eerie parallels. This whole idea of uh, anti-truth, you know, the ability to tell lies, and everybody knows that you're telling a lie, but you tell it anyway because you don't care. Uh, the the kind of erosion of the rule of law, 
um, and this this sense of of how to control um, the medium. All those things seemed eerily um, relevant uh, to our our current experience. And and a guy who <coughs> who very consciously is trying to evoke emotional appeals to nation uh, in ways that transcend whatever the reality is going on. And the last thing I would say is election theater. Nobody's better at election theater than Donald Trump. Uh, at the beginning, Karakowski says, I, I, I didn't care enough about my life. I don't care enough about my life to lose respect. To trade it for respect. To trade yes. it for respect. Thank so you. How, much, how much do you think that the narrative of respect has played into Putin's success and to, a, and to a parallel extent into make America great again. Big time. I mean, I think a lot of people in Russia admire Putin because he's strong. And you can see how much he tries to cultivate that. You know, he was a two-bit functionary for most of his career until he becomes president. And then suddenly, you know, in TV, he's, he's going out, he's shooting guns. He's like a James Bond action hero. Right, and now he, he's, he strips down. He's always, you know, filmed without a shirt. He's playing hockey. I, I have talked to people who played hockey with Putin, and you know, his team always wins something like twenty to nothing. Um, so it's a he's a must be a very potent player, um, and so um, you know, but that idea of strength I think is very powerful, and and it's weird the way that kind of fiction can take hold. I mean, let's just say, you know, um, there's a show called The Apprentice, which celebrated uh, a hugely successful businessman who just happened to be the world's worst businessman and was originally conceived as a parody. But in the case of Putin, you know, he comes across as a kind of action hero. He was never elected initially to, to be president. He was appointed. So it's, it's, a, it's, it's really interesting. But particularly in Russia, the idea of strength is terribly important. And I think that's one of the things. I do agree that that is one of the reasons that he respects or reckons with Hodakovsky and this whole idea of the kind of like prison ethics and stuff like that. You've got to punch first, and then after you've <laughs> you bloodied each other, then you can talk. <laughs> I've seen the film. I'm going to open it to questions, so I just uh, one more. Um, I, I've seen the I've seen the film three times now, and Kodakowski is still a cipher, a complete cipher. So, um, how much did you think you penetrated him? I, I, I think you see bits and pieces of him. You know, one of the most interesting moments. Uh, I, I'd like to think it was a moment when I was interviewing him. And there are a few of those, but one of the interesting moments for me <coughs> is a moment when he's actually talking to Ksenia Subchak, when she's acting as a journalist, when he just gets out. And she says, well, aren't you angry at the people who put you in prison? And I, I, I hope I can get this right. He says, uh, it would be a sin against the truth um, if I said that was, uh, th that I didn't have some feelings about the matter, okay? but." Just before he says that, his eyes kind of roll back in his head. And so you sort of get this idea that here's a guy who's possessed of tremendous rage, who's trying to get control of it. Control is very important to him. And, and, but more than control, he's also trying to find what I do think he found in prison, which is an ability, I'm not going to go so far as to say it's something like mindfulness, but, but some kind of uh, equilibrium that allows him to go forward and not descend into that uh, abyss that Berezovsky found himself in, you know, when he was so suffused with self-pity. So that that creates in him, and it makes it difficult to get him to emote because he's trying to be serene, even though he's, he's still um, bubbling with anger in many ways. Yeah. Raise your hand if you, you have a question. Right here. 500, yeah. yeah. Hey, Alex. Hey, man. <laughs> Great film. Thank you. I loved it. Um, I thought the most revealing line in the movie was when he said, I'm not an ideal man, but I'm a man of, of ideals. ideals. Right. So having spent all that time 
side do you fall on more? Is he not an ideal man? Well, I, I, I fall on both sides. He is not an ideal man. But I do think he is a man of ideals. I, I think that's one of the things he learned in, in prison. And I think what helped him was that he was always kind of an abstract thinker. But I, I you know, it's hard to believe, um, you know, the other interesting thing he wrote about in prison, one of the things that we quoted was he said, uh, uh, while in prison I learned that life is not about having, it's about being. Well, you know, um, you can say that's phony, but uh, you know, from a guy, it's hard to imagine Donald Trump saying that. Let's just put it that way. And and, and so I did really buy that that sense of um, transformation. Now he is a guy who still maintains all his money, but even while he was in prison, he had the strength of character a number of times to stand up for some of his close associates and risk death. I, I should say one of the more disquieting moments when I was interviewing Hodakovsky was when I sort of jokingly said, so did that dry hunger strike work out for you? Ha, ha, ha. And he, and he looks at me with that weird smile and says, I don't joke about things like that. If it hadn't worked out for me, I wouldn't be here. Yeah. Hmm. OK, point taken. Yeah, and the way he says it, it would have been over in, you know, very quickly. Well, that's yeah. the dry, that, that's, I didn't know that. It was the difference between a dry hunger strike and a wet hunger strike. That was something I, I learned on this film. Well, I do think he is, a, uh, despite the fact that he said, I don't want this film, not that he had any editorial control, he said, I don't want this film to be about me and Putin, but to some extent, it, it's all about him and Putin in many ways. Um, but he tries to find his own space. I mean, I think he's still, he's still haunted by what Putin did to him. So, I mean, now, the way the story plays out also owes something to you know, us as, as, as filmmakers in terms of how we constructed it, you know, in terms of this sort of um, showdown of the OK Corral between the two of them. But he is haunted by Putin, I think. Do you see him having a, a, a political career in a post-Putin Russia? I, mean I don't think so. I, I think for, for the reasons that, that, that Dirk Sauer mentions. I mean, he, what does he say? He wants to be Jesus Christ, but he has a past. And, and I think that he was so reviled for what he did during the 90s in terms of the enormity of the money that he made by doing these unholy deals with the state that it would be very hard for him to have a political career in Russia. But I think he could have an enormous influence. And it was interesting to me that <coughs> in the exile community, he is something of a rock star. Like when we would travel and uh, when we would walk around in London when we were filming, Russians were always coming up to him if they'd see him in the street, you know, demanding that they pose for selfies. You know, they, they recognized Tartakovsky as this guy from outside. So he was something of a rock star. Up there. And we have people like Zuckerberg and uh, um, Amazon, Jeff Bezos, that are in that kind of oligarchic position now that we see being brought before things that tech giants have too much power, certain people have too much power. Could you see that same kind of a reversal going on here that affected the people that were okay and doing things there? Well, I think it's an extreme, I mean, it's, it's, it, 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 the, it's the situation in extremists. I mean, we have a lot of very powerful capitalists in this country who exert enormous influence, but but not in a way where the, you know, I, I think what happened in the 90s in Russia, where you had a state that was so weak um, that um, they were just desperate for the money that these oligarchs uh, had, that they were able, that, that they basically gave away the store in a way that was, it, it's cautionary tale, I think, in terms of how money works politically in this country. But it was way beyond anything that we've ever seen here in terms of the leverage that these guys had over the central government. Uh, he still fears for his life, right, every minute? He still, uh, it's believed that he's under a kill order. Uh, we even showed a clip or a, a, a newspaper clipping of that there. He's kind of made a decision that he's going to hide in plain sight. 
When I was filming him in the street, no. I will tell you that when uh, there were events where he showed up with his family, there were a lot of people with earpieces around. But uh, while he's walking around by himself, no. And his view is, look, <clears throat> if they want to take me out, they're going to take me out. So I'm not going to live my life in fear. And I think that's both sensible in some ways, but also part of the macho Harakovsky. And his family is in the UK, most, most yes, of the Yes, they are. UK. His son lives here in the United States, actually, from his first wife. But all the other kids are, are in the UK. One of the things that was most surprising to me was that in an environment like that, where they basically his sentence and everything was completely made up, and uh, and he was made to be this evil person, you know, by the government, they control the narrative completely. How a hunger strike could be so effective in that sort of environment? Did that surprise you? And you know, could you did you get any insight on how how that could be? I. I think there's a I think there's one explanation which is a broad kind of political explanation and the other explanation is maybe a more Russian explanation. Um, the political explanation which is pro I'm maybe more able to be confident on is that look, if you have somebody who's that well known and they die in prison, he becomes a martyr and that becomes a political problem in the future. So you need to be careful that somebody like that doesn't die. I would say that, you know, even in this country, um, there was concern about, um, you know, prisoners in Guantanamo when they went on hunger strike, and they weren't powerful at all. With somebody like Khodorkovsky, that was a, a big deal. Now, the Russia argument is mano a mano. It's like, okay, are you going to take me out? What do you got? And it's like his willingness to put his life on the line, which is something he says a number of times, I think gave him a certain moral force and authority. Ha! <laughs> well, you'd have to ask him. But I will tell you that probably one of the reasons is taxes. Is <laughs> as a as a rich oligarch, he has a much better tax situation in the United Kingdom, which, by the way, is where Bill Browder has become a, a citizen, because his taxes are much lower. By the way, for those of you who know Bill Browder or know of his story, the guy who wrote Red Notice, when Putin put Khodorkovsky in prison, he wrote a rather prominent op-ed at the time, cheering Putin on for really sticking it to Khodorkovsky. Interesting fact. In the film, we talk about the pressure of Sochi coming up. I think that was, nobody knows exactly why Putin did what he did, and I was never able to get him, though I did approach him for an interview, I was never able to get him to sit down to tell me his view. But I, I think that there was, a, you know, and, and it is in the film in terms of the amount of pressure that the West was putting on Russia to release Khodorkovsky. And I think with the upcoming Sochi Olympics, Putin felt it would be uh, a good political move that might get the West more on his side if he did it. <clears throat> now, it turns out that a lot of Western leaders didn't show up at Sochi and maybe out of peak or... <laughs> and probably for a lot of other reasons, soon thereafter, uh, Russia invaded Crimea. But um, um, but I, I think that that was the reason. And then I think Putin had a certain, I, I, I kind of buy in a way this idea that, that for these two characters who had gone toe to toe, that there was a certain cheap sentimentality over the fact that Khodorkovsky's mother was dying. But I think it was, it was really the Sochi Olympics that was probably, and the pressure that Germany in particular was putting on Russia. How much, how much it's on Russian's mind, uh, what's happening in the US vis-a-vis -vis the idea, the uh, reality that Russia has interfered with our, with our election? I mean, what, what, is, is it something that is discussed there? And what's the point, what's the perception? I, I think it's certainly discussed there. I, I, I think a lot of Russians I spoke to felt it was kind of overplayed. I, I think that they felt that, and Khodorkovsky himself feels that, um, you know, it didn't make, at least for, as far as he was concerned, 
you know, Russia wasn't interfering from a position of strength. It was almost from a position of weakness trying to punch above its weight. And the other interesting thing that Hodakovsky said was that according to all of his sources who are around Putin, that Putin was as shocked as anybody else when Donald Trump won. Um, he was, he was, uh, you know, they were, they were, you know, applauding, but, uh, but they were completely shocked. One more? Yes, that one. That's it. Last. So I guess we should really watch out for Russian Olympics, as in 2008, um, Putin started a war with Georgia, and in Sochi Olympics, invaded Crimea, and it's becoming known that he's putting his billionaires or um, anyone that he has control over in Georgia or uh, U.S. Um, and outside of his power, he sort of will be, as one of the documentaries said, um, he will be as good as a corpse. So it's more like he's in part of a system where these billionaires have, um, and oligarchs have comfort of maintaining their stability. And do you think if there was somebody else then put in the system would um, be different? Or is there, does Hartikovsky have any oligarch friends that would be totally against um, him? I mean, I, I think that um, Hartikovsky's hope is that power becomes less centralized. His, his hope is that the, you know, Russia over time can, um, can assert uh, um, more power in its representative body rather than this single figure. Because in the single figure, there's this inevitable, from Hodakovsky's view, this inevitable sense of corruption, this kind of mutual favor giving and taking, and that that is the, the, the biggest problem of all. And that may or may not end with, uh, with, with Putin, if indeed he does step down. That was, a, that was a really intriguing moment for me. I, I asked Tartakovsky that in a kind of metaphorical way, like, dude, what's your biggest nightmare? And he responded with a very specific and tangible idea of a nightmare and the idea that the phones weren't working because if you have a system of gangster capitalists and there comes a day where the gangsters don't feel you're useful to them and they come for you. Uh, one other thing, and then, then we're finishing. One other thing that I, I, I like very much about the film is a film that shows uh, how frail democracy can, um, the fragility, frailty of, of democracy. Was that in your mind before you started? or? It no, it was really something that I learned along the way. I mean, and, and I didn't know that much about, you know, um, Russia in the 90s. And that period was a really interesting period for me to dig into. And by the way, if there's one thing I wish I could have emphasized more, it was a peculiar period because while, you know, the rule of law was clearly very weak, if, if existent at all, in terms of free speech, there was a tremendous ability to speak your mind during the 90s. You know, so in that sense, there was that element of democracy that was very powerful. But you could see how quickly that would wither without, you know, certain other protections like the rule of law and other things. And you could see how quickly <coughs> things turn. Um, and, and also how, again, I, I probably wasn't able to emphasize it um, enough uh, in the film, but how people in positions of power are able to create fictions that benefit them, uh, benefit their um, their ability to take away democratic norms. And one of those things was the fact that oil proces, prices rose in the late 90s, early, early 2000s. And so Putin could take more control even while the country was being suffused with money because of rising oil prices and say, see, more control is better. Well, I want to thank Alex for, for the film and for being here and you for coming. Thanks.